glad the cross is empty. Amen. Amen. Full. Let's thank all the false religions still got Jesus hanging on the cross, trying to work their way to heaven. We're going to Luke chapter 7 this morning. Now, today is Super Bowl Day. Well, I don't need to say any more. But you better not use your tithing money to gamble on this football game. <laughs> That's what I'll just let you know about that. Amen. Now, some churches, of course, are setting aside the whole day for that uh, stuff. And I'm sure a lot of folks like sports. But I'll tell you what, things have... Uh, certainly got out of hand yes. since the early 1900s and 1950s. And well, over in the seventh chapter, we have uh, another special day on Wednesday. What is it called? You know. It's uh, Spend Your Money Day again. Valentine's Day. And that has a uh, rather complicated history. They, uh, if you study the how many has ever tried to study Valentine's Day? Everybody, you know, the Catholicism mixes paganism in any way it can to bring everybody into the Big Ten. Right. And then the Roman Empire it was uh, so much less, I think it's called Luke of What's the name of that day? It was a special pagan day, fertility day. It was all mixed in with the Valentine's story. And uh, Valentine's Day, one of the Valentines, there's two, possibly three characters. One was a Roman priest killed by the Goths in uh, 296 AD. The pagans, of course, even. Uh, the other one was a bishop, a pastor, a preacher, a man of Interamna, Interamna, Italy, 90 miles from Rome. And uh, they jailed him, and of course they were martyred uh, by the, the government uh, that day. <clears throat> you know, the Caesars were like crazy people. Sort of like Saddam Hussein that ran Iraq for years and Putin today. But uh, the story goes that when he was in jail, how many had gotten Valentine cards? The tradition of that was little notes were sent to Valentine, the little children would bring them and drop them through the cell window to encourage him. And then you have the kisses, XXXX, and that was uh, that was a Christian symbol of the crucifixion. So all of that is tied together. But you know, that's 1,500, almost 2,000 years ago, all this was taking place. And uh, Chaucer, the poet, he wrote, uh, it's called Birds in Pairs, his poem, and on the 14th, this is when birds and animals start pairing up and, and mating. It was two downy woodpeckers right outside the window on the tree this morning. I looked out front, and there's the robins, right on the schedule every year, out in the yard, pairing up. And then we have two skunks under our house <laughs> pairing up. They're toxic. I'm trying to catch them and annihilate them, send them to skunk heaven. Uh, but this is not the first time. We've had six raccoons in our garage, and I went, went to buy a cage yesterday, a special cage for skunks. And that, the people I met at the Northern Tool Company were looking for a way to get rid of the squirrels, the groundhogs. So they said, this one guy in Rogersville told me, I have killed since December 10 skunks on my property. And uh, he lives out in the country. So uh, it is uh, mating season for a lot of stuff. And uh, so just hang in there. It happens every year about 
the middle uh, of, of Valentine's Day or February. Now, as we go over to this story here, and this is a love story, and we might say, or we'll call it, why don't we love God more? Why don't we love God more? And so we're going to read from 36 to verse 40 and study this. Let's stand and read a little bit of it from 36 to 40. It says in uh, Luke 7, verse 36, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. He wants Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, sort of like we do, spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And Simon here, he saith, Master, what? Say, say on. Say on. The Lord, we ask you now, say on. May we hear what you have to say. Take it to heart and maybe show us why we don't love you more than we really should and that we really do. We pray now that you'd use our study here this morning that you, as we start our new week, invest our time, talents, treasures, and our testimony in your work. May we leave here better able to serve you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let's be seated, if you would. Now, I... Uh, taught this lesson uh, similarly back in uh, 17 years ago on the same day of, of the month, the 11th of February. And uh, that's 17 years ago. And you know, nothing in the story has changed a bit. And so what we see here, a few things. And uh, why don't we love God anymore? Well, there's two people we see here, particularly. Uh, we have one sinner woman, and then we have one self-righteous Simon, and then we have one seeking Jesus, and we have one stalking Jesus. We have one serving Jesus, and one is sarcastic and cynical and sinning against Jesus while he's there. There was a, a statement that I ran across here years ago, but uh, it goes like this. My greatest responsibility, and my greatest responsibility is to be in love with all that God is in love with and hate everything that God hates as well. Is that not a great responsibility? Yeah. My greatest responsibility is to be in love with all that God is in love with and hate everything that God hates as well. That reminds us of the scales, balance scales of justice, doesn't it? So we have some reasons here, I think, why this man just couldn't get the hint of what she was doing. And so we'll go through that from 36 to 39 and all the way down to the end of the story. So here we have this sinner woman and this Pharisee named Simon. Now this story is in all the Gospels, but it's not the same story. This is about in the middle of his ministry, and the others are near the Passover day, where the other anointings, of, there were several Marys, we understand, right? Three or four of them. And uh, so let's examine uh, Mr. Simon here. She, she was there to love on the Lord. And he was there to maybe pick him apart. And uh, so she's just surrendered to him and Simon is not surrendered to God at all. 
Whether he's saved or not, I have no idea, but I don't I don't really think he is at this time. But it's, it's just something is stopping this guy from being as humble as this woman. So it looks like maybe, first of all, from 36 to 39 we read, it looks like he had a habit of judging others. It looks like he had a habit of judging others. So when we'll read it again, one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. When about went unto the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And here we have the woman here, verse 37, which was a sinner when she knew Jesus was at me in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box and an ointment, stood at his feet behind him. You try to visualize this. Where's Jesus? Where's she? Where's Simon? Stood at his feet behind him, weeping. Now it says he's already sat down and sat down to meet in verse 36. And so she's behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head. Girls, do you think you could ever do that to, for your husband? Wash your own feet. But she didn't. She was totally surrendered. Kissed his feet. Anointed them with the ointment. Now here we go. This uh, maybe he's a judgmental person. None of us have ever done this, have we? <laughs> Thinking silently or out loud. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, "This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who, who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner." So we have, it looks like maybe, just maybe, he had a habit of judging others. I think Jesus taught us that in the Beatitudes, didn't he? Judge not that you be not judged. Something about telephone pole and a splinter or something. <laughs> you know, it's a big deal. And, and so we all do it, but we better stop it. Because it's certainly not showing love for others, and it's certainly not showing a love for God when we when we think so much of what I think so much of. Secondly, hey, look at here. Secondly, 40 to 43, look at those verses. So it looks like maybe he had a habit of judging others, and it also looks like he had a habit of supposing he was always right as well. Verse 40 to 43, Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I am somewhat. Now, is that a little bit or is that a lot? I think, it's a, I, think I have a lot to tell you. I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he, being the confident one he is, trying, you know, knowing, knowing everything in his prayerful mind, Master, Say on. Uh, you know that's not the thing to tell Jesus. <laughs> because he will have the last word. And the first word. Simon here, listen to this. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. And one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Now I tried to find the values of those today. But it fluctuates. It, it's uh, 16 cents to... $200. It's just all over the place. But here is a 10 to 1 differential. So 500 pence versus 50. They both owe this certain creditor. <clears throat> How many like to be in debt? <laughs> How many are good at it? <laughs> you didn't raise your hand then either. 42 says it when they had nothing to pay. Ever been there before? Raising three kids in Forest County, Missouri. I, I've been there. Yeah. Had a heart attack in the process. Stressed out back in 1985. But we've been debt free for many, many decades now. Church is debt free, or most of our people are debt free. And uh, that's why we can do more for the Lord when you don't have creditors breathing down your neck, right. plus interest. When they had nothing to pay, he creditor frankly forgave them both that's a nice guy 
Tell me, Simon, therefore, which of them will love him, the creditor, most? Simon answered and said what? I suppose. And we don't, we should not live by supposition. We better know the facts. Yeah. Because you can really get hurt by just supposing your way through. Jesus got lost. No. He, he didn't go anywhere in the temple. His parents left. Three days journey before they recognized, hey, where's Jesus at? And they had to come all the way back. Why? Because it says they were supposing that he was with his friends and relatives. And all through the New Testament, you'll find the doctrine of supposing is something we should never do. We better know the facts and not just suppositions. You never, never trust a program on the History Channel. Yeah. It is full of suppositions. Yeah. Ancient aliens and people didn't build the pyramid. Could it be possible? It may just be, if, you know, they, that's what the, the devil did to Eve in the garden. Yay, half God said. Yeah. Get you off balance. You better know the facts. So it looks like he had a habit of judging others. It also looks like he had a habit of supposing he was always right. It's sad, but we all have these tendencies. Hopefully they're not our habits of life. Thirdly, look at 44 to 46. We see here also, it looks like, because I don't know him, you know, I don't know if he's in heaven or not, but it looks like this maybe, thirdly, he had a habit of minimum giving. Minimal giving. Look what it says here in verse 44. <clears throat> he told him, Simon, you have judged right. You, 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 you have made the right choice here. <clears throat> he says in verse 43, to whom for he forgave most. And he, he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. And then 44, he turned to the woman. So Jesus is turning to the woman. And he says to Simon, so he's looking at the woman, but he says, Simon, look where I'm looking. Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me. Well, what, what did he not do? He gave him no necessity, water. Without water, you're dead. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Second here, he blamed him. Thou gavest me no kiss. This woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. 46. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. His head, okay? That's what he's saying. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. So, no water represents necessities of life. No kiss, it's the emotion or affection of life we all need. And then the oil. We, uh, in the last few years, we have heard about essential oils, have we not? And it makes you feel better, uh, the smell, the aroma, peppermints and all these different essential oils. Well, they, they use these all the time and mix them with olive oil and uh, other expensive things. And so he asked him, why haven't you anointed my head? Well, see, in the Bible, you use, oil is for anointing a king. It's for, it's for a royal ceremony for a king. You don't just pour, it's, it's not much, it's just enough to show it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit, by the way. And so she is taking her precious ointment from her alabaster box, and she is anointing his his feet, but not his head. That was that, but she's identifying with royalty. But she didn't do his head, but he tells Simon, you should have anointed my head when I came in here. Not just because he feels better or make his hair look shiny, but he called him master, didn't he not? 
He, didn't he lie right there? A fake, maybe a fake Christian. Churches are full of them. But most fake Christians don't go to church. They just say they are Christians. Yeah. And they don't give God one thing. They are minimal people. They're fearful. They love themselves more than they love God or anybody else on earth. And these are minimal giver. How many know if you love God, you will give for God's work? Yeah. You will want other people to know Christ and live forever. Why do Christians become so selfish? It's because of fear, not faith. People who live in faith give and live for God. People that are fearful don't live by faith, but they, they hoard and they spend and it's all in their little world. The people live by faith, guess what? The world is the field, Jesus said. And the more you give to God and his work, from the right heart, God will give it back to you multiplied. Amen. Man, we have so many stories about our old members here that have been given to the Lord for 50, 60, 65 years. and They're old and they're crippled up, but guess what? They're the most blessed people in this room because they have been doing this for so many decades. And God has taken care of them till they pass the grave, just like Brother Russ. He didn't have much, but what he had, he used it for God. Yeah, and uh, now his ministry continues on worldwide. I think we had 105 views so far on the Facebook Live from around the world watching that funeral that Russ had sent scripture to all these different countries for all these, these 33, well, let's see, 36 years we worked together. <clears throat> so he had a habit of minimum giving and minimum living. Well, let's finish up here. Look at verse 47 to 50. So we've seen that it looks like maybe he had a habit of judging other people, maybe a habit of supposing he was always right as he was so proud. <clears throat> he even judged Jesus, did he not? If this man were a prophet. And then we see he had a habit of minimum giving. All he gave Jesus was an invitation, maybe a plate of food. But in 47 to 50, we see that this lady, this, uh, this sacrificial woman that loved the Lord Jesus Christ, she had a habit also. And it seems like she had a habit also of being honest before God giving him her all and best love that she could possibly give him at that time. So we see in verse 50, 47 to 50, and he says here, Wherefore I say unto thee, Simon, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she did what? She loved much. She had a habit of loving God and giving her very all. She loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Now, if we stop there, we think she worked her way to heaven. But it goes on. They that sat at me with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? So he finishes out the statement. He said to the woman, Read it with me. Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Hey, remember the day you got saved because of faith in Christ? Amen. And you left in peace for the first time in your life. I mean, that's the, that you, you know I have got a dose of salvation. When you leave in eternal peace, I will live forever. I will never have to worry about the threat of hell again. That's what the Bible teaches, you know. It doesn't say, oh, you're happy today, but you better keep working because you could, you know, might lose it or give it away or somebody to steal it. No. If, you, if you're, you're saved, 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 the song says. And you have a peace that passes all understanding. But if we're not careful and become worldly, we will forget the uh, 
precious salvation that God has given us. We need to get back to the basics. Did not Revelation teach uh, that you have left your first love? Repent, it says there, and do the first works. Get on back to the day you got saved and start from there again and get that peace that passes all understanding and quit trying to keep up with the stupid, sinful world. Yeah. They will take everything you've got. So we have here, she had a habit also of being honest before God and giving him her all and best love that she could come up with. She realized she was forgiven of much. Now, over in chapter 8, we see maybe who this was, the woman. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass afterward, so right after that, that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdoms of God, and the twelve were with him. Here we go, verse 2, 8-2. Luke. Certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, first one is who? Yes. yes, there she is. Mary called Magdalene. Now, was she not so privileged to be the first one at the tomb of Jesus? I mean, she was rewarded for her love. It doesn't say that was who it was, but I'll tell you, I think that's I think that's who was there. I mean, this, she knew I had been forgiven of much, and I'm going to do much for Jesus Christ. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and then Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their what? Of their stuff, of their substance, of anything they had. These people showed their love for Christ, but not that not that hypocrite Simon, hopefully after that, that he got rebuked by God himself, hopefully he had a, a different ending of his life. But here I believe we see who went all out of their way to love on the Lord. It'd be good for us when we go to bed and say, Dear Lord, I love you. It'd be good when we wake up in the middle of the night, Lord, I still love you. And wake up in the morning, praise God, Dear Lord, I love you. And all through the day, stop and just tell God you love him and then do something about it. Not just easy words. Now over in Romans 7, I'll read just a little passage here. But the question is, are you or me, are we a 500 pence debtor or a 50 pence debtor? Did you get the message? Yes. He that is forgiven of much loves much, and he that is forgiven of little loves little. So maybe you see yourself as, uh, oh, well, God saved me, and I'm, I'm glad for that, and it's not a big deal, and, you know, I, I wasn't too bad after all. <laughs> now what Paul says here, Romans 7, and uh, look at verse number 13, and he's talking about the Bible, the law of God, Look at 13 in the last sentence. That by the law, he says here, that sin by the commandment might become what? Exceeding, exceeding sin. sinful. When you got saved as a sinner, it's because you were exceeding sinful. Amen. You've always been exceeding sinful. We've all been exceeding sinful. And that's why people don't serve God because they think they're, oh, I had a little debt. <clears throat> no, no, you had a 500 pence you have a maximum debt to be paid on the cross. And that's why people are lazy, even if they're saved, they do not look at how wicked they were in God's eyes. When I got saved, I knew I was a sinner, but when I started reading the Bible, <clears throat> I knew I was wicked. I actually thought maybe I ought to get saved twice because I didn't realize how, how God saw my wickedness as a young 27-year-old scoundrel ruining my life and my family's life as well. So we have to look at ourselves. And he goes on here in verse 14, 7, 14 of Romans. For we know that the law is, what is it? The Bible is spiritual. We know that the law is spiritual, but who am I 
But I am what? Carnal sold under sin. If we did not have retribution for breaking the law, most of us would be lawbreakers. Yeah. Do you come to a complete stop at a stop sign or stop light? Or do you just drift on through? Well, that's breaking the law. Yeah. But we don't see it that way. You didn't give a turn signal. Well, you're breaking the law. I mean, we, we go about breaking God's laws and man's laws and we don't, we don't think much about it because we probably don't take our salvation that seriously either. But we are, we're indebted for everything. How many would rather go to hell than heaven? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. But we're going to heaven because of the mercy of God. But our sins nail Jesus to the cross. And uh, everybody in here is a sinner saved by grace. And we owe God all the love we can give him. Right. Love the Lord thy God with all thy mind, heart, soul, and strength. And then what else? Love thy neighbors thyself. What else? Love your enemies. I mean, Jesus gives us no wiggle room at all. But it starts with God. And then it transfers out to our neighbors, our family, friends, and the rest of the world. And the homeless street people, houseless, you know, enemies, the Russians, the Chinese. We, we just need to show them that Christians are different because God made us different. And so here, we're going to leave. How many 500 pence debtors are here today? I am. And we ought to not forget this. That do not think lightly of your salvation. Amen. And if you do, maybe you're not saved. But you're a dirty, rotten sinner in the eyes of God, and he sent Jesus to take care of that for you, to pay that sin debt. And so today we <clears throat> say, why don't we love God more? Maybe because of the things we've seen in Simon's life. And uh, judging others, supposing we're right all the time, living a minimal giving life to God and, and taking care of ourselves more than anything else. But be like this lady here. Her habit was what? Being honest before God and going and giving him all she had, her best love, until the day he died. So Lord, we ask you now to bless in our invitation. We have this week of Valentine's Day and spending money and people substituting lust for love. So we ask you now to help us Christians do what this, this lady did, giving her all and her emotions and her wealth and her time, her tears. So help us now to go out and serve you better and tell you how much we love you and show you uh, what we do for others. So we pray now that you save a soul today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's all stand, please.